Well, good morning. Oh, thank you. I'm there's, glad there's three of you here. Let's try to get good morning. good morning. We are so glad you've chosen to join with us today. God has been blessing me this week. I trust he's been blessing you. Oh, what a great time of the year it is to serve the Lord. I'm always grateful for spring. And even though we sometimes get rain like we have the last couple of days, what a beautiful part of the country that God has given us to be in. So I'm not sure why you would be thankful today, but I hope you find things in your life to be thankful for. And just knowing that God loves us is, is great enough to begin with. So let's start by, pray, by worshiping him in prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house to worship with you and with others. Fathers, we've come. We've come as humans. We've come with sinful lives in our background, and yet you've forgiven us and you've loved us. And even though we're imperfect, Father, we pray that today as we praise you, that you would accept our praise as worthy of you. Help us, O oh Lord, as we sing. Help us as we pray and as we share together. Uh, may your will be done. And may we just sense your presence in a mighty way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. The great old hymn of the church is, How Great Thou Art. Would you stand with me as we sing? Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior. My soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the wood and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I
And as we continue our song service, let all the people praise thee. And as you think about what you have to praise the Lord for, get out your ten-stringed instrument and be ready to beat the time on the chorus. Let all the people praise you. brought your 10 stringed instruments but some of you are saying by not clapping mine's out of tune well use the last chorus to get in tune let's everybody do it on the last chorus as we sing the third verse and I, a thousand tongues to sing. Everybody said, amen. amen. And everybody said, praise the Lord. He's been so good. Pastor? In just a moment, our ushers will come and receive our tithes and offerings for the day. Uh, just a couple of announcements I want to share with you. First of all, uh, this coming Saturday is a special birthday party in our church. Uh, Ruth, we're going to be celebrating her 90th birthday on Saturday. Uh, we are celebrating at the Best Western here in town. And so uh, if you're planning on being there and maybe you haven't told her yet, but let's let her know today just so they have a, a count there of how many are coming. Uh, but that's this Saturday, I believe, from 2 to 6 p.m. Is that correct? Yeah, 2 to 6 p.m. So plan on being there for that. Also, just so you know, next Sunday is our first Sunday of the month. It will also be Potluck Sunday. So if you're here in the service next Sunday, you want to plan to stick around afterwards. Um, as a pastor, one of my favorite Sundays has always been Potluck Sunday. As you can tell, I, I like to eat and like to try some new things. And so plan on sticking around next week for that. For this week, we do have our Monday lunch tomorrow for those who are less fortunate. Tuesday is our adult Bible study here at the church at 11. And then Friday, our youth are gathering here at the church from 2.30 to 4.30. I think on Saturday, I'm sorry, I think this past Friday, Jeanette had like 13 teenagers here. So it wow. seemed like there was 100 people in the church, but that just me. So, uh, but we had a good time, and the kids were hanging out, and they had a good lesson, and I think, I think everything was great. But just be praying that more and more youth will want to come and learn about Jesus on those Fridays. So I think that the rest of the, bullet, the, rest of the announcements are in your bulletin. Ushers, if you'll come forward, we'll pray for the offering and... Gracious God, Heavenly Father, 
what a privilege to worship you today. What a privilege to worship you not only through our songs, but also through the giving. Father, you've blessed us in so many ways and given to us to provide for our families. Now as we give a portion back to you, would you please take it and bless it once again. Bless it in the ministries of this local church, but also in churches across the country and around the world. May the faithfulness of your people bring about the glory in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. With that, we'll invite you to stand and greet one another in the name of our Lord. At the same time, we'll dismiss our children to Children's Church. Let's sing that one more time and find your seat if you would please. I'm so glad I'm a poor. responsive reading today we're going to do number 207 the cost of discipleship
wasn't in your bulletin today because I sent the wrong paperwork somewhat, but we have it here. So if you'll read with me responsibly. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. He said to another man, follow me. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading from his word. Grace that is greater than all our sins. Let's sing the first, the third, and the last verses, please. Number 84. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will said that whosoever will believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. And thank the Lord, we are the whosoever. Let's sing that great old missionary song, your first and the last verses, please. Whosoever will. Whosoever hear breath, shout, shall the sound, spread the blessed tidings all the world around. Whosoever 
aren't you glad you're included in whosoever will? No matter where you're from, no matter what your parentage is or your uh, ethnicity, God has a wide open call. Whosoever will, come my way. You'll be saved, have everlasting life. As we enter the time of prayer today, let's sing that little chorus, I love you, Lord, as pastor comes to lead us in prayer in a moment. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. go before the Lord in prayer this morning. The altar is open. If you'd like to come and pray here at the altar, you're welcome to do so. Otherwise, you're welcome to sit certainly where you're at in your pews or stand whatever is most comfortable for you. I want to share a couple of great things today. One is that we've been praying for Roy Fulton. Uh, he's had this mass and they took a biopsy, I guess, and they tested it and it is not cancerous. So praise God. He want to say thank you for all of our prayers. Um, we serve an awesome God. Uh, I am not here to say it was never cancer, because I believe we can serve a God who heals. So whether it was or was not, it is not anymore, because we serve an awesome God. And so we praise God for that. At the same time, I have another person in my life that I've been praying for that it was under a, a similar circumstance and spent time in the hospital this week. They, too, found out that they no longer have cancer. And so God is at work, folks. God is still the healing God that he's always been, that we read about in the Bible. He's still doing great things. And so we give him all the praise for that today. Also want to pray today for a few. Uh, Heather's little Lucas, I believe, is the one who's in Children's Hospital or has been. Uh, he's supposed to get to go home today, but uh, she's thankful for our prayers. Continue to pray for them as, as this little guy has really had some struggles this week. Um, and then Harry's niece passed away yesterday, and so we want to lift up his family too. It's uh, a tough time for that. But let's just go before the Lord and pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we give you great praise. Praise because you are the God of the universe the God of all creation, the God who not only is alive, but is a sustainer God, a purposeful God, a God who loves his creation. Father, we have no idea in our humanness how great you really are. We just know that you over encompass everything that we can believe in, and we trust you. We trust you because of your great love for us. We trust you because you're faithful. We trust you because, Lord, even when we don't understand, we know that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. Father, thank you so much for your great love for us. Thank you for being the type of God that we don't have to worry he's going to change his mind or just reach out and zap us. But you are a God who has a plan, and so we thank you. Father, today we do thank you for these good reports of your faithfulness and healing people. For Roy today, Lord, we thank you that it wasn't cancer. Lord, we still know that he's hurting and, and still needs your touch. And so, Lord, continue to touch him and uh, take away the pains and give us doctors wisdom and helping him. But, Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you that you've taken the cancer away. We just trust, Lord, that that's part of your healing power, and we give you all the praise. Again, with my brother, uh, Lord, that I spoke about, thank you for that his cancer has been taken away and that you have healed him as well and continue to be in his life and speak through him and to him through these times. Father, be with others today who need your touch. We think of little Lucas and how grateful we are for hospitals and doctors. And Lord, we just pray as he hopefully comes home today that that would be your will. 
We pray, oh God, that during that time as, as that takes place, that, Lord, uh, you would just be with them. Give them safe traveling and mercies back from Seattle Children's. But, Lord, may he continue to grow and, and be the, the young man that you created him to be. Father, be with others today who are struggling. There may be others in our church or others in our family members who are struggling with sickness or disease. And, Lord, again, we thank you for your healing upon their lives as well. We also thank you, Lord, for being with us at our greatest time of loss. We think of Harry's family and the loss of his niece, and we just pray for your comfort to rest upon them. Father, it's always hard to say goodbye, and we don't always know why things happen the way they do, but Father, we trust you, and we thank you for the days you give us. Father, today we thank you for our great country. We thank you for the freedoms that we have and, and, and that we enjoy, and we thank you for those who serve and protect us. We thank you for the brave men and women of our military forces who put their lives on the line on a regular basis who are willing to make the call or take the call that says, stand up for me. We pray today, Lord, that your hand would be upon them and that you would keep them safe and protect them and that you would raise up beside each one, brothers and sisters in Christ, who could share the good news of the gospel. We pray as well for our local heroes, Lord, for our police officers and our firefighters and our EMTs. We thank you for the service that they put into our community, and we pray for their safety, Lord, that you would take them home to their families as soon as their shift is over. Lord, we also thank you for our church and for the areas that we represent here today. We thank you for our neighbors and our co-workers and those that we have opportunities to minister to. Father, we just pray right now that as we are imperfect people, that your perfection would shine through. We pray, Lord, that you'd use our lives to speak into the lives of others. We pray, oh God, that as you have spoken to our hearts, that people would see your great love in us and want to know Jesus as well. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. We commit our plans and our hopes and our dreams. We commit, Lord, that we want to be your children and to serve you proudly. Father, we live in this world today that's all mixed up, where things that don't make sense are taking place, where people are making choices that we just don't understand. But, Father, we know that you're God, and we know that you're in control. And so we pray, oh God, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray, oh God, that people would come to know you in a saving way. Father, we just thank you for all that you're about to do. Thank you for all that you're about to do in our service today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. You know, we've been kind of studying through this this year on 1 Timothy. We, now we're moving into 2 Timothy, uh, starting with chapter 1, and excited to see what Paul is going to say. So if you're there at 2 Timothy chapter 1, please stand for the reading of God's word if you can. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience. As night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am now persuaded, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of, his, of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am, yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have been entrusted to him for that day. Father God, as we break this bread of life this morning, as you shared it upon me, Father, speak to us anew and afresh about your vision for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
You ever wonder why life has to be so hard? Maybe you've been known to ask the question, why can't we all just get along? I know I have. I mean, we look around this great big world today, and nothing's really changed, has it? We have more knowledge, understanding, innovation, technology than ever before in the history of our world, and it still comes down to the same thing as it did in the beginning in the Garden of Eden with the first couple. Will we obey God or the evil one? So why can't we all just get along? Or, or maybe another question is, why is life so hard? Maybe it's just my age or my station in life, but it seems like everywhere I look, I'm dumbfounded by the things that are going on in our world. Now, by dumbfounded, I mean shocked or surprised or astonished to the point of not knowing what to say about these things. I watch the news about Israel, God's chosen people, and how they've been attacked by these people called Hamas, only to see a bunch of our universities protesting going on over the country in support of Hamas and the anti-Israel movement. And I'm dumbfounded. Our local news is filled with rampant shoplifting, stealing, murder, and other crimes where suspects are arrested or not, and rele- or then released and not prosecuted at all. And I'm dumbfounded. Christians are being attacked for proclaiming the truth of the gospel in a nation that calls itself a Christian nation and promotes the freedom of speech, except when it comes to being a Christian. And that leaves me dumbfounded. Yet Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Could it be that the real problem lies with our vision of what life is supposed to be like? What comes to mind when I bring up the idea of having a vision? In this case, we're kind of talking about the future. Uh, Vision is that elusive thing that dares to dream big dreams about the future. Vision's been called a hope with a blueprint. Vision is what the inventor has when he or she thinks outside the box to create something new. Vision is what a mother has as she looks at her newborn baby and imagines all that the child could grow up to become. Yet we go through times when our vision seems to fade. The flame of our vision begins to dim, its passage, passion begins to ease, and its heat begins to cool. And I think that's what's happening to young Timothy, the Apostle Paul's young protege, You see, we know that the Apostle Paul has sent Timothy to try to salvage a mess in the church in Ephesus. Yet when he got there, he found himself in way over his head. The entire leadership team in the church was older than he was and didn't respect his leadership. To make matters worse, Timothy was more of the shy, timid type. He had a tendency to avoid confrontation. And we know that the stress of his ministry assignment was affecting his health, as he found himself sick with some constant stomach ailments. In the meantime, his beloved mentor, the Apostle Paul, has been arrested by the Roman government. Timothy's vision may have dissipated a little bit. The excitement and enthusiasm he'd once felt when he joined Paul's ministry some years earlier seemed to be almost gone. Somewhere between his bad health, his discouragement about the church in Ephesus, and fear for Paul's life, Timothy's vision was slipping away. And Timothy needed his vision renewed. And I think that's a big reason why Paul wrote him the second letter. Now, the second letter is the last letter we have from Paul's pen before he was executed. Maybe we can almost look at it as the last will and testament of Paul as he reflects back on his vision that fueled his life and ministry. We don't know how long exactly it's been since his first letter, but it certainly seems like Paul's circumstances have changed. In this letter, Paul again is writing from prison, but this time he knows his time is near. He's basically on trial, but it's not going well, and he's hoping that Timothy can take care of a few issues in the church quickly, uh, and then we'll come see him before he dies. But knowing that Timothy is struggling, Paul uses this letter to renew Timothy's vision as an apprentice of Paul and as a servant of God. This morning, I want us to look at how Paul encourages Timothy Timothy to renew his vision for what God has called him to, and see how it might apply to our lives as well. So let's begin with our qualifications. As is typical with Paul's letters, he begins with a greeting to Timothy about who he is and what Timothy means to him. We read, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. These verses serve as a reminder that Paul was not just some random guy who wanted to write a book or simply tell a story to whoever would listen. Part of the problem we face in our world today is there's so much information at our fingertips 
It's easy to get caught up in someone else's vision or ideas that have no business in our lives. You want to know why I think this massive protest is going on on our college campuses today? Because we often send our kids to colleges based on name recognition of the college to learn from professors that are promoting their own agendas. We need to stop and take a look at what we're doing. Where are we sending our kids? What are we doing with our kids? And what are they learning from these people? Here Paul is stating his qualification. He is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Folks, you can't get much better than that. At the same time, he's writing to Timothy as a son, as someone he cares deeply about. Paul is writing because he has Timothy's best interest at heart. What does that mean for us today? Well, I think what it means is before we read a book or listen to another podcast or, or watch a video designed to draw us closer to Christ, we need to know who the author is, what they believe, and what is their purpose. Otherwise, we subject ourselves to being led astray. One sad fact in our world today is that there's a great percentage of Christians, Christians, and I don't have the exact percent right now, but higher than 50% of Christians who find it more important to read other books other than the Bible. Now, we do truly believe as Nazarenes, as, as Christians as a whole, that the Bible is the authoritative word of God, right? That, that he inspired it, that, it, that it's truthful. That is uh, uh, applicable, if you will, to our lives. How is it that as Christians who believe in a holy God, we somehow feel like this book over here is more important than the book right here? Not that it's not good to read things, not that it's not good to, to find out new things or to study what someone else has figured out, but we need to start with the scripture as our basis. And we need to know who's speaking into our lives. Today, as I said, we have more technology than ever before. We have the internet, and, and we have even pastors on Facebook who are proclaiming things. As you know, I have my YouTube channel, Sermons by Pastor Aaron, where people can check us out. But we need to know who's trying to speak into our lives and what they believe. Folks, there are pastors out there. There are people out there who are speaking things that are not true, or they go against what we believe. If we're not careful, we find ourselves accepting these words that come into us because we don't realize that they are speaking from a wrong perspective. That leads us into our experience. In verses 3 to 5, Paul talks about the ministry together and how Timothy's faith came to be. He said, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as night and day. I remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. And I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you. What we see here is a reminder that when times get tough, when life gets hard, including when ministry gets hard, when we want to ask the question, why can't we all just get along, that God is faithful. Amen? When the tough times come, God is faithful. When the, when the disease comes when the, the financial hardships come, when, when the relationship problems come, God is faithful. Have you ever noticed that back in the Old Testament when God did something for the Israelites, they often built an altar as a, remembrance, as a reminder of what God has done for them? Why did they do that? Because there are so many stones around, they needed something to do with them, right? No, absolutely not. They did it as a focal point to remind themselves, this is what God did here. When you cross in this land and you see this altar being built or, or this pile of stones, or what is, this is what it represents. This represents a time where God stepped into our lives and did something for us or for our forefathers. We live in a time when marriage isn't so sacred anymore. We live in a time when people act like, well, it's just a piece of paper. We live in a time when we've forgotten that, that marriage is about a symbol. It's about a point in time when we said, I do, to another person. When we stood before someone, hopefully a, a person who represented God, uh, but we stood before someone and said, I want to be with this person. I'm making a covenant with them, a marriage covenant before God to say, I want to love them. And I'm not going to love somebody else. There are other points in our lives where we, we stand and we make commitments or we, we stand and we say, this is a significant moment in my life. I don't ever want to forget it. And so Paul here is reminding Timothy, this is what happened for you. 
This is who you are. Wouldn't it be great if once we became a Christian, we never had any more problems? Yeah, oh my, it's a good way to say it. It would not be great. That's not what life is all about. We could not be useful to God if we didn't ever have problems again. In fact, God isn't calling us to not have problems again. God is simply saying, I will be with you. I will walk beside you. And oh, by the way, when I do these things, make some points in your life that you can look back on. Now, we don't build altars and sacrifice on them anymore. I, I get that part. But we can still, in our mind, have a pinpoint that says, here's what God did for me. Some people, I'm not saying it should be you, but, but some people make notes in their Bible with certain scriptures or, or they, they leave notes behind in other places of a diary or whatnot that says, here's what God did for me so they can look back. What is our experience when it comes to serving the Lord? Folks, the devil is a master at making us forget what God has already done for us. The devil knows that we find power and strength and resolve in the fact that Jesus has already died for our sins for those who choose him, resurrected over the grave to show us power over death, and the fact that the devil can't hold us, and sent us his promised Holy Spirit that we might live in his strength rather than our own. Those are already things that have been done. We're not waiting for them to be done. We're not waiting to see if they're going to be fulfilled. We're not waiting to see if God is faithful. God has already done these things. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus rose again. Jesus ascended to heaven, and the Holy Spirit was set to, to set to live into our lives. All we have to do is accept it. The, for Timothy, it started with his upbringing from his grandmother and mother, and it continued on with his ministry as Paul's apprentice. And it calls us to remember back at how God has worked in our lives as well. And that leads us to our calling in verses 6 to 12. In verses 6 to 9, Paul wrote, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is through the laying on of hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So, so do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or me as his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. These verses are a reminder for us that life isn't easy, that being a Christian isn't easy. In fact, being a Christian is hard. I mean, it's, it's easy to become a Christian. If you want to be a Christian right now, we can stop and we can pray and you can pray and ask Jesus into your heart and you will be saved. That's as easy as it takes. You don't have to do something first. God doesn't say, hey, go fix yourself and come back. This is how easy it is. But to live out the life that God calls us to is hard to do. That being said, living the Christian life, even though it's hard, brings God's love, brings God's hope, and brings God's joy into our hearts. But in our society today, we tend to want everything to be easy. Think about the vision that the mother has as she looks at her newborn baby and imagines all the child could grow up to become. Now, as parents, we want our kids to grow up feeling loved and secure. We want to protect them, right? The problem that is in our society today, I think we've taken it too far. In some sports, they no longer keep score because they don't want the kids to experience losing. Or we give out participation trophies to every kid on the team because we don't want them to feel like they aren't as good as someone else. The problem is we're raising a generation that doesn't know what it means to struggle. Struggling is a natural part of life that makes us stronger. Think about it. how do we learn to crawl? Well, babies struggle to move, right, until they figure it out. How do we learn to walk? By struggling and falling down. How do we learn to read and write and do math? Well, by struggling through it. But what happens to us if we don't? You ever think it's funny that as parents, uh, we have selective memories? We look at our kids and, 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 and we think that we wish they were still young. We just, Stacy, I think, just said the other day something about, you know, we're looking at Zeph and he's now five and we've seen a little boy at like three years old walking with hand and you're thinking, yeah, we kind of miss those days. And yet we forget about all the days in between, don't we? Can you imagine, though, if your child never grew up? I Meaning, what would happen if they got bigger and bigger, but they never learned to crawl or to walk or take care of themselves? We wouldn't wish that upon anyone, would we? On the other hand, for those of you with adult children, don't you enjoy when you get a chance to sit down and really talk with them? Not that they're perfect today. We get that. 
Not that they're not still learning, they are. But the opportunity to sit down with, a, with an adult who is maturing and, and, and getting you know, to that point in life where we can have a conversation. Isn't that a great relationship that makes our hearts full? Could it be the reason God allows us to struggle in this life is so that we can mature in our relationship with him? God's desire isn't that we become babies in Christ and simply stay that way. God wants us to grow and mature and be in a relationship with him. God's purpose for our, our struggles is to help us mature in our walk with him so that we can become more like him, so we become more like Jesus. Yes, God has a plan to use you to reach others, but, but God's plan with you is not to simply say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you to use you. I'm taking you to be in relationship with you. I want you to be my child. I want you to be my son or daughter. I want you to be able to commune with me. But again, notice what Paul is saying to Timothy in the second part of verse 8. Join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Let me say that again in case you missed it, because it's not very much fun. Join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Paul is saying to Timothy, he's asking him, hey, will you willfully join me in suffering for the gospel? Will you choose to struggle in order to serve the Lord? Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem fair. Paul has already been through so much. In fact, all of the disciples struggled and suffered through persecution. And for the most part, they were killed because of their faith. How is that fair? Why would a holy God allow his people to suffer? Could it be because he loves us enough that he won't leave us to be infants in our faith? Maybe the reason why our world seems so upside down today is because we haven't struggled enough. Maybe these kids on college campuses are protesting because they never had to struggle with freedom or even basic needs. Maybe our nation has become a nation of weak-minded individuals because the generation before them refused to let them struggle. Or maybe, maybe the devil's behind it all. Remember Ephesians 6.12? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Could it be that the devil is simply using the dummy down of America to win this fight? We have to wake up as Christians, folks. We have to recognize what the devil is doing in our society if we're going to stand up against it and fight for the Lord. We have to be willing to put ourselves out there and, and struggle, as Paul called Timothy to do, with standing up for our faith. For example, I had a, I had a, I said, I had a conversation uh, about, with someone about homosexuality. And the question I was given with this basically, is it really a bad sin? And I answered no. And the reason I answered no is because it's no worse than any other sin. Adultery, premarital relations, murder, stealing, lying, they are all sins. And in the sight of a holy God, sin is sin is sin. And whenever we sin, we fall short of a holy God. Now the good news is, is God doesn't say again, go perfect yourself and come back to me. God says, come to me as you are, and I will transform you to be more like Christ. And so sitting here today, whether you're saved or not, you should know that we are all sinners. If you've accepted Jesus, we've been saved by his grace, not because of our works. If you haven't done that yet, you can do that today. Now, we do believe in a state of perfection, meaning that we're fulfilling the purpose God has for us. And we believe as Christians in the Nazarene faith that, that we no longer have to sin, that we've been set free. We've become a new creation, and, and so we no longer have to sin, if you will. Kind of that drive has been taken from us, but we're still tempted, and at times we may in fact fail. And if you failed at times... I have two. We just simply go back to God and he continues to help us. But our desire is not to sin. Our desire is to live a holy life because he lived a holy life. The problem in our society today is that the devil has once again confused these issues, just like he did in the Garden of Eden. The devil says, did God really say you can't be a murderer or a sinner or a homosexual and belong to him? No, God said, come as you are. But when we come, God begins to transform us to be more like Christ. You see, the issue is not about God's love, which is what the devil wants to make it to be. It's about our sin. The problem in some churches today is they are welcoming sin into the church and even celebrating it. 
Can you imagine if someone here today was an alcoholic? You know, the truth is, and I'm not asking for hands, believe me, but there may be alcoholics in here. Because alcoholics believe that they're alcoholics their whole life. They don't ever not become an alcoholic. They just stop drinking, uh, usually by the power of God. But can you imagine if someone showed up and, and they were an alcoholic, and, and whether they've been saved and delivered from alcohol or whether they're saved and still struggling uh, with alcohol, because that does happen. We get saved, and, and there's these sins in our life, especially addictive ones, that we have to really work through, that, that God has to help us with long periods of time. Or maybe there's someone in here who's an alcoholic and still enjoys drinking and, doesn't, and isn't saved, and, and that's okay as well. But can you imagine as a church if we had potluck on Sunday next week and I brought a keg of beer to, to potluck? Hey, we're going to accept this alcoholic over here and we're going to accept them because the way that they are drinking. We're going to all of a sudden start drinking at church. Okay, that's not going to happen at our church. But there are churches out there, folks, who are accepting the sinful lives of people as okay and even beginning to celebrate it. And it's not the people who are in sin are bad people because we're all sinners, right? Because we've all been forgiven. And because there's people out there who aren't saved that we know from a, a human moral context are good people, right? So this isn't about God's love as much as it's about standing up for what we believe in God. And it goes back to the idea that dumbfounds me that we live in a world, if you will, or a country, if you will, that supposedly is a Christian nation where we can't proclaim our Christian values where we're supposed to have freedom of speech without getting in trouble. Without saying that we're somehow racist or somehow, um, the word just escaped me, but we're, we're somehow um, non-inclusive of people, that we don't like people. Can I tell you that because God loves people, we love people? That We've had people, I've had people contact me who, who live alternate lifestyles, and, and I say to them, you can come to our church, we will love you at our church, I do not have a problem, but you need to know what, how we see these things. God has called a husband, a man, a woman to come together in marriage. We're not going to celebrate people just living together. We're not going to put people to the, to the cross and stone them but we're going to love them and try to help them. I was at the hospital the other day uh, visiting, uh, well, I was visiting Jim Dotson, and I happened to walk out of, of one of the exit doors, and there's like five people right there at that point in time, uh, four in wheelchairs with their hospital gown on, and they're all smoking. And I'm like, not sure that this is the purpose, Right? And I think in my mind, how is it really that this person has come to the hospital, and I have no idea what they were there for. Please, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I don't know anything. I'm just surmising in my head. But here are these people in the hospital, hospital gown on, um, most in wheel, and four to five in wheelchairs, all these people smoking, thinking, how does this make sense when you're at the hospital with something wrong? You're probably sick in some way. This is probably not the most healthiest thing for you to be doing. Yet the hospital doesn't come out and say, hey, because you're going to smoke, get out, right? They're still trying to help. When we go to the hospital or even to the doctor, we're looking for someone to help us with the ailments we have. And it's not always easy. Sometimes, as Roy was doing, we're waiting, it seems like, for weeks to get these test results that we need back to see where to go next. Sometimes we get answers and we try them out, and yet it takes months and months to, to figure it out, especially if they're medical or medicine-type issues. But they don't give up on us. In the same vein, we don't give up on people. We love people. And when people walk through the doors of our church or hopefully walk through the doors of our house or walk into the doors of our lives, we choose to love them because they are a son and daughter of a holy God. But loving them doesn't mean that we have to be accepting or celebrating of their sin. And the same is true in our own lives. Okay? Because the devil is not only tricking us as a group of individuals, or as a church, if you will, he can also trick us as individuals to start saying, you know what, there's this little sin in your life, but it really doesn't matter. And if I'm stepping on your toes right now, that's a really good thing. Because you know what, I'm stepping on my own toes too. God doesn't want 99% of us. God wants 100% of us. 
And until we're 100% committed to God, until we're 100% perfected, until we're doing everything God's way, God is going to work on us, not because he wants to point it out and say how bad we are, but because God wants to say, I can make you better. I can make you more like Christ. I can make you fulfill your purpose better if you're willing to listen to me. But the devil is there saying, don't worry about it. If you're stuck in pornography, if you're stuck in alcoholism, if you're stuck in eating addiction or some other addiction out there, maybe it's a gossip addiction, I don't know what it is. If you're stuck in it, give it to God and let him be in charge of it. Confess it to God and say, here it is, Lord, and and you know how I'm struggling and I want to stop and I'm going through this addictive cycle or I'm doing this, but Lord, I, I want to stop. God will help you. The question becomes, Can we see the vision that God has before us? The vision that God has for you is to be his child, to be in relationship with him one day for all eternity. In the meantime, his vision is to transform you, to to make you more like Christ, to, to use your life to bring about his kingdom. And so the question becomes, are we willing to take on the vision that God gives each one of us? Are we willing to be like Isaiah and say, here am I, send me. Paul today in our text said to Timothy, hey, I know it's not easy. I know I'm asking a lot. I I, I know where you've been. I'm reminding you of that. And I know where you can go. Will you go? The question for us today is, will we go as well? Father God, thank you for this day and uh, for this message you provided to us. Father, as I've been speaking, I know you've been working on me this week and, and especially today with this message. And Father, I want to be 100% sold out for you. And so, Lord, with that, I, I give you every, every ounce of opportunity to point out in my life those things that need to be transformed, those things that need to be fixed. I am not perfect. I, I want to be, but I'm not. And so, Lord, continue to transform my life and the life of each one in this room. Help us be more like Christ and help us to stand up Lord, even if it means suffering for the gospel, that others might hear the good news of Jesus Christ and be saved. Father, now as we sing this last song together, speak into our hearts that we might truly praise you as we lift up our hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand in closing. We're going to sing this song by Chris Tomlin on YouTube, I Lift My Hands. Sing out if you can. for the weak let faith arise let faith arise I lift my hands to believe again you are my refuge you are my strength as I pour out my heart
let faith arise. Let faith our agenda. May it be focused on you with all that we do, and may you prepare us for the week to come as we celebrate your world with those that we come in contact with. May they see your heart and your love through our lives. And Father, if we have to struggle, may we struggle in you and in your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being a part of our service today.